and hear the lecture later on. I think it doesn't look good. Share the screen. Uh, are you able to see my screen, students? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. So this course. Uh, this course will be taught, will be uh, taught by me and Professor Baskar. So first uh, seven to eight weeks I will teach, then the rest of the semester, uh, Professor Baskar will teach this course. I already mentioned that in email, but again I'm just saying for your information. So which portions he will teach, which portions I will teach, you will get to know by end of this uh, uh, lecture. <coughs> this is I would say this is very important course in one way. Why we are studying all these subjects like mass transfer, heat transfer, process control. Why are we studying all these courses in chemical engineering? You will get to know uh, through this course. Why are these courses important? And how this each and every course in chemical engineering is interrelated? All those aspects will be more clear. That is one. Another one is through this course, you will get to know various chemical industries. What are the contains? How they how they run? How in, how individual processes are interlinked between each and every process? Is also you will be able to get to know. So, just to give an idea, just to give you an idea. Just to give an idea, I wanted to start with a very, very uh, simple example. How chemical process industries are important or became a part of our uh, life. Just to give that, uh, uh, give that view, I've just started a daily routine of a common man. I'm just giving a, a, a small example, a daily routine of a common man. So I'm sure uh, first thing we do in everyday morning is brushing teeth and bathing. This is very uh, simple example. Uh, you might say what is this? This is very uh, small example, but just to illustrate a point, I've just taken this very, very small example. <clears throat> brushing teeth and bathing, right? We all do first thing <clears throat> our, uh, in the morning. May not be for the students, I'm <laughs> just joking. So brush. Brush is made of polymers, right? Brush is made of polymers, whatever we are seeing, hard polymers and soft polymers. And soaps and detergents is also made from the fats and uh, other chemicals. Next, clothing, right? Clothing, clothes and textiles, processing the textiles, like cotton, cotton clothes, polyester clothes, various clothes, that also comes from the uh, chemical process industries. Then we take breakfast and lunch food after, after clothing. We take breakfast. Breakfast contains food industries, sugars, alcohols, synthetic essences, fertilizers for producing various crops, and uh, petrochemicals, which are used for the killing insects and maintaining, enhancing the crop production. This also comes from the chemical process industries. And then, Usually we attend classes, but just right, attending online classes, writing papers, pens, polymers, like tablets we use, computers we use, this is also made of hard polymers. Then even for the recreation, if you take football, football made of uh, polymers and uh, synthetic polymers, tennis rackets, polymer composites and coatings, 
even for the resting mattress nowadays most of the mattresses are foam mattresses polyurethane foam mattresses the polyurethane foam mattresses are also made from, made in the chemical process industries beds composite woods right composite woods are the more popular than wood and the solid woods nowadays even the composite woods requires uh, adhesive adhesives and glues and many things in the production process even the coatings what we make even to maintain the self life of the beds they use various coatings that is also come from the chemical process industries transportation is another so we have to move here and there go to university and come back or go to home and come back so fuels and vehicles i just taken very simple examples if we take we can see that everything we need in this modern world majority i won't say everything majority of our uh, majority of things available for a common man are being produced in chemical process industries it is not an exaggeration uh, uh, exaggeration to say exaggeration to say chemical process industries became an indispensable part of our life it's not at all an exaggeration chemical process industries became an indispensable indispensable part of our life without that we cannot survive it is almost come to that end that without this chemical process industries we cannot even survive of course this is not an obvious thing but in a majority of the people's life it is like that majority of the people's life the scenario is like that so <clears throat> so that's why chemical process industries or the chemical production or chemical engineer or process engineer is very very important role very very vital role so that is one uh, aspect and the aspect is i have just taken from a newspaper or also from the indian uh, ministry reports this is in uh, 2012 2013 i could not get the statistics later later ones in a clear clear way so i have just taken the statistics of imports and exports right if you see exports exports in every year more than 100 140 billion dollars are being exported the value of 140 dollars being exported from our country to various countries if you see major share major share are the petroleum products come from the petroleum refineries we actually import crude from the foreign countries we also we also have some reserves in our country then we process in the refineries and again refineries are laid up full of processes chemical processing units in oil refinery all the streams all the all the divisions of chemical uh, refineries is major major role come from the chemical processing engineer so chemical petroleum products pharmaceutical products and uh, these are the important shares and that is also come from the chemical process industries cotton fabrics those also come from the chemical process industries rubber glass products come also come from the process industries and metal process industries also come from the chemical process industries if you see of the major items which i listed here in the exports is also come from the chemical process industries chemical process industries also contributing to our gdp that's what i want to highlight our country's gdp now if you see import even import most of the import materials also are the raw materials of the chemical process industries most of the imports listed here is are the required raw materials for the chemical process industries so even from the our natural our day to day life requirements even or from the country's growth one of the important contribution come from the chemical process industries just to give a more i have just listed this one but this this uh, just similar to the previous one then i just uh, taken a snapshot uh, on the about the gdp of our country initial days uh, initial initial like 1950 early 1950s the gdp the main contribution or the major contribution of our gdp country's gdp is from the agriculture 
less of service industries and less of uh, 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 other industries. But now, as the time progressing, the service industries that take over, that definitely we all know from our campus placements or whatever, we can clearly see that service oriented industries are major dominating. But still, 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 the process industries, the chemical process industries percentage did not decrease. Rather, it has increased from 15 to 27 percent. So the, that is, although the growth is less, but the value did not reduce. Rather, it still increased, although it is little less percentage. Even in agricultural industry, major share comes from petrochemicals. Even still, uh, that is also part of uh, 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 part of the or uh, still contributing the GDP of our country. So from these three analysis, what I want you to say, chemical process industries are still are the major important playing a major important role in our GDP growth, our day-to-day -day life, and also in the export imports for country. <coughs> So, not to boast too much, so I just want to move on to the next one. That is, what are the major segments of Indian process industries? What are the major segments in the Indian process industries? So, it's been divided into five. One is base chemicals, the base chemicals, petrochemicals, man made fibers, that is, synthetic fibers, industrial gases fertilizers, chloralkyl industries, and other inorganic and organic chemicals. These are the base chemicals. These chemicals are required to produce various other components, various other chemicals. And the major share, major share of Indian process industries uh, come from the base chemicals. Like, like if you say in the 100% of the production, almost 60 to 70 production will, 60, 60 to 70% of the production are the base chemicals only. Not only not only in India, I have taken scenario for India, but same scenario being observed in UK, Australia, US, and other uh, uh, countries. Specialty chemicals like dyes and pigments, leather chemicals, construction chemicals, personal care ingredients. These are sort of less percentages. Then pharmaceuticals, APIs, that is active pharmaceutical ingredients and formulations. Like every pharmaceutical product, like the tablets or whatever uh, syrups we consume, is contained two things. One is active pharmaceutical ingredient and the formulations. Then agrochemicals, this is of actually used to be very high per quantity, but with the less of demand in the agro agricultural products, agrochemical production has reduced with time to time. So insecticides, herbicides, these are the various chemicals used to uh, kill the whatever uh, uh, things going in the uh, fields. Then bio biotechnological industries, biopharmaceuticals, bioagriculture, bioservices. So these are the five major segments of these base chemicals are the major. Base chemicals are the major, major share of uh, Indian cross industries. So that's why this course we wanted to highlight uh, more, highlight more of base chemicals in this course because that is the major industry. So major revenue or major percentage come from this. So we wanted to teach more of base chemicals production in this course. Although the process and uh, the concepts are similar for other things but we wanted to give as much as possible details, as much as uh, information on the base chemicals as part of this course. Also, as the curriculum, as the curriculum also suggests to focus on base chemicals, we were also focusing on the base chemicals. <clears throat> that means we're going to talk about petrochemicals, we're going to talk about industrial gases, we're going to talk about fertilizers, we're going to talk about inorganic and other chemicals and plural industries. We're going to talk about all these uh, uh, all these types of base chemicals production uh, across the globe, or what what are the methods used to produce these chemicals across the globe? What is methods basically? Hope you're able to follow, right, students? Able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Thank you. So, so let me start with natural resources because whatever base chemicals we are uh, showing in the previous slide or whatever products which I showed in the earlier slides, they're not naturally available, right? So we are converting some of the natural resources available to us into those commodity products. Whatever natural resources available to us, we are converting them into commodity products which a common man can use it. So what are the, what are the different types of natural resources? I think you all know this, but still I wanted to uh, give, give you what are all, uh, just give you again like a kind of recapitulation or revision to what you already know. So natural resources are divided to two, two types, non-renewable and renewable resources. So I think I'm sure all of you know non-renewable and renewable. Non-renewable means resources that can only be used once. Once you use it, that's gone. Non-renewable resources. Resources that can only be used only once. So, renewable means resources that can be used over and over again. Renewable means resources that can be used over and over again. Giving an example, non-renewable resources. Like one example is, the resources that are consumed when used. Resources that are consumed when used. For example, coal, right? Once you burnt it, that's all. You will not get coal back again. Once you take coal and burn it, the coal is got exhausted. So the coal is example of non-renewable resources. Other one is petroleum fuel, for example, diesel or petrol. Once you consume it, that's all gone. We want to get back to the same product again. So these are the petroleum reserves and coal. These are the non-renewable resources. Resources that can be exhausted by the overuse is also comes under the non-renewable resources. Renewable resources, resources that are always available, wind and water. Wind and water, that's always available to us. That's always available to us. That's called renewable resources. And another example, resources that can be recycled. Resources that can be recycled. For example, metals, like if you take iron and steel, we can recycle it, we can get back it. But, you know, some of these, some of these components can be exhausted by overuse. Even though we're able to recycle metals and all, but this can be exhausted with the overuse, then that also goes back onto the non-renewable resources. So it's very, the sources are consumed when used, that is straight away non-renewable. The source are always available, straight away renewable. But side by side, there's another definition. The source that can be exhausted by overuse, that comes under non-renewable. The sources that can be recycled, that comes under the renewable energy resources, renewable sources. Just to give uh, more uh, examples of natural resources, we have uh, plenty of natural resources available in our country. So I'm just uh, giving some of the examples of natural resources available in India. So we have biotic and abiotic resources. So, so whatever biotic resources is basically what we have, what we, what is all coming from the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen sources. So, major, major amount of resources available to us is coal. In, in, in terms of biotic resources, the major, major uh, resource available to us is coal and we also have the biomass and the coal is the fourth largest reserves in the world. The reserves available in India will be fourth largest reserves available in the world. Later we'll talk about what are the problems with our coal or whatever the merits and demerits of our coal 
how can we process this coal and all we talk about in the later part of the uh, course. Then we have the oil reserves, oil reserves. Then we also have the natural gas reserves. But of course, as I said, we have the reserves, the resource of oil and natural gas, but there are some issues like uh, the contents or the impurities, all the factors. But we have less of oil reserves and natural gas in those compute compared to the <clears throat> other countries. Now we are, we also have some of the abiotic resources like metallic minerals, non-metallic minerals, minor chemicals, and we also have the nuclear resources. In the metallic minerals, we have the major major results available to us iron ore. The major results available is iron ore. That's why a lot of exports are going from our country to uh, foreign countries. We also have the manganese ore. We also have the bauxite and we also have the chromite. I just listed only four. We have many other types of the metallic minerals available in our country. Non-metallic minerals have given example of limestone. Limestone is available. Minor chemicals like marble is available. We also have the uranium and thorium. This is nuclear resource. So whole idea is we have these natural resources. We have these natural resources. We wanted to convert these natural resources into the commodity products. That's in between what comes is chemical process industries. Chemical process industries takes these natural resources and convert them, process them, and to produce the various commodity or consumer products. That's the whole picture. We have natural resources and we wanted the commodity products. The what comes in between is chemical process industries. So that's what I'm just showing here. This is a big picture. This is a big picture of process industries. So we have coal, oil, natural gas, biomass and minerals. These are the natural resources available to us. We take these natural resources and we process them in a chemical process industries. What are the major things in chemical process industries? The chemical process industry contains unit process and unit operations. That is reaction and separation in a broad way, unit in reaction and separation. And we produce them various chemical products like heavy chemicals, coal chemicals, explosives, plastics, petrochemicals, drugs, insecticides, whatever I showed, whatever we all know. These are all, these chemical products can be further converted to the commodity products. So the major, the major thing, so the major role is chemical process industries. This is where we are. So process engineer, looks after these various types of unit process and unit operations. So, so typical process industry structure, if you take any process industry, any chemical process industry, it follows this structure. So we take raw materials, and just now I shown natural resources, but the natural resources are not 100% pure. The natural resources are will not be a single component. Natural resources are not a single component. It has impurities. Sometimes it has a mixture of components. So those raw materials has to undergo through a physical treatment, has to undergo through physical treatment. It could be a removal of impurities or it could be a separation of a mixture components into individual components or sometimes simply that we have to give a physical treatment such that the reactor performance will be very high like whatever like reactor what is reactor reactor is a vessel where you need to maintain certain temperature certain pressure then that certain reaction will take place so raw materials are converted to products, right? So whatever best possible conditions required for the reactor, those 
pre-treatment, those conditions will be done through the pre-treatment or physical treatment. Even after reactor, whatever products produced from the produced in the reactor also not a pure components. Whatever products produced from the reactor are also not a pure components. We will see these examples later. So those pure components, uh, the whatever products coming from the reactor is also a mixture of components. Whatever products coming from the reactor are also a mixture of components. So we need to separate them. We need to separate them into individual components. Again, we need to do the physical treatment. After the physical treatment, we get the products. So this is the natural resources, and these are the products which I seen and which I showed in the previous slide. And this is what happens in the chemical process industries. This is what happens in the chemical process industries. So the heart of any reactor, the heart of any process industry is reactor. The heart of the heart of any chemical process industry is reactor. Before sending the raw materials inputs to the reactor, we will go. We will have to do certain physical treatment. After the reactor, we will have to do the certain physical treatment. So, the reactor is the heart of every chemical process industry, and only a chemical engineer knows all the details or are will supposed to be expertise in the reactors. Or uh, we we know much more details of reactor construction, reactor design, and everything only chemical engineer will know compared to the any other engineer. Even the chemistry person, even chemistry person doesn't know full details like a chemical engineer knows about the reactor engineering. <clears throat> even in the physical treatment, if you take mass transfer operations, mass transfer operations are all only uh, all, only known to the chemical engineer, not even mechanical engineer. Mechanical engineer might know, but very, very less. So,
हेलो स्टूडेंट्स यू गॉट डिस्कनेक्टेड और एबल टू हियर मी सर नाउ वी कैन हियर यू व्हेन व्हेन इट गॉट डिस्कनेक्टेड व्हिच स्लाइड स्लाइड 10 और 11 आई बी ओके I was just keep speaking. Then suddenly asked a question, no response, and I thought, okay, maybe it got disconnected. Thank you for being available online. Even though it just got disconnected. uh is this slide uh, are you, uh, like are you is it got disconnected at this slide or later so this slide only this one no, the next, next one. one oh this one yes sir okay okay maybe i'll explain again <coughs> so any chemical process industry takes the naturally available resources and converts them into consumer products or commodity products natural resources available to us are often either mixture of components or it contain certain impurities so those raw materials available to uh, available to us are uh, will be processed will be processed often called pre treatment processes once those raw materials are pre treated that will be sent to the reactor with the reactor the raw materials are converted to products products produced in the reactor or the products coming out from the reactor are also a mixture of components we will never have a 100% pure components coming out from the reactor so the products from the reactor also be need, needs to be processed to produce the required products for example let me give an example we all know that crude oil is available right crude oil is a natural resources but the crude oil which is coming from the uh, a is it from the is it from the land reserves or from the reserves under the ocean it contain so many components uh, the carbon number can vary from c1 to c44 carbon number of the alkanes alkenes present in the crude oil can vary from c1 to c44 as such directly we cannot use crude oil as a any product even if we use it the efficiency of the product will be less so the crude oil has to be processed right what is the pre pre process required some crude oil might contain impurities like sulfur if sulfur content is very high we cannot directly convert send them to a either reactor or any uh, any uh, any reactor because it will be two things it cause it, it causes the it, it makes an it makes the catalyst poisoning effect and also enhances or increases the corrosion of the vessels present in the reactor so the sulfur will be removed the sulfur or other impurities will be removed before it sent to the reactor after the reactor we will get multiple products like like propylene propane ethylene ethane we have 
various types of products will come. We can, again, we will not be able to use this mixture of components right away. We need to separate them into individual components. Propane separately, propylene separately, ethane separately, ethylene separately. The propylene can be converted into polypropylene and used as a polymer. And uh, propane, butane can be combined, sent as LPG. And ethylene can be converted to polyethylene and can be again used as a polymer. That way, in the chemical process industry, takes the naturally available resources, does the physical treatment, then sent to reactor, again goes through the physical treatment process to convert them into the final product. So reactor is the heart of a chemical process industry because that is the way you are converting from raw materials to products. Transformation of one component to other component is happening in the reactor. This reactor engineering or reaction engineering is only taught to chemical engineering students. That is only chemical chemical process engineers knows very well about the reactor, so react, reactor engineering. Also, mass transfer operations, whatever uh, uh, we are learning, starting from distillation, absorption column, extraction column, uh, crystallization, all these methods are exclusively taught to the chemical engineering in taught in the chemical engineering curriculum. Only chemical processing engineer knows. That's why the chemical processing needs are the plays a crucial role in any process industry. So <clears throat> here, here. Chemical engineering traditionally, um, traditionally chemical engineers very very olden days just limit to the chemicals production like organic chemicals, inorganic chemicals production. But now the chemical engineering has grown like that. It is now it is expanded to multi dimensions. The chemical engineers deals with petrochemicals. Chemical engineers also deals with semiconductor production. Semiconductor production. Chemical is also deals with nanotechnology production, nanotech nanotechnology based product production. Chemical is also deals with food and agricultural. Another important role chemical in place is environmental control. Like nowadays, we have seen the major troubles coming from the particle emissions, NOx emissions, SOx emissions, CO2 emissions. Chemical in the news deal with producing various methods, the products to reduce this environmental pollution control. Chemical needs deals with pharmaceutical production. Again, we have the bioreactors. We have, again, we have the mass transfer uh, operations in the pharmaceutical production. Chemical needs also plays a crucial role in the energy production, like solar panels construction, solar panels development. Uh, just one second. Hello. Abhi, I'm in class. Huh? I will message you afterwards. So another one, another is personal care products. Chemical is also deals with personal care products, especially winter time. We all use moisturizer, emulsions, right? Emulsions also dealt, uh, emulsions also producing these personal care products also produced in the chemical process industry. So chemical pro chemical engineering or chemical process industry is deals with not only base components, also very, very uh, specialty products also. Now, <clears throat> US National Academy of Engineering Society, they have announced 14 grand challenges for engineering. Although announced uh, 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 more than 10 years ago, still these are the major challenges Still, these are the major challenges. These are the 14 grand challenges for engineering. Whatever highlighted in red color, they are directly related to the chemical engineering. That is, make solar economical. To produce solar panels, we have the silicon vapor, silicon uh, slides. They are all being produced in the chemical process industries. 
then we have the providing energy from the fusion providing access to clean water to produce clean water we need to produce membranes the membranes also being produced in the chemical process industry developing carbon sequestration methods like nowadays to to, to absorb the carbon or co2 uh, people use emi based adsorbents people use metal organic frameworks people use geolites all these are being produced in the chemical process industries advanced health informatics advanced health informatics now everybody want point of care diagnostics in these days right people wanted uh, immediate uh, rapid antigen test to detect the covid 19 whatever even to to detect pregnancy uh, pregnancy test kits even to detect blood group point of care uh, paper based blood group techniques even detect cancer or whatever the drug concentration whatever you talk about in the advanced the health informatics but all the base methods are being developed by the chemical engineers engineer for better medicines and managing nitrogen cycle i can talk about many many examples but all this out of 14 seven are directly related to the chemical engineering problems or chemical engineers can deal or can give a solution to this what i wanted to highlight from the different angles is that chemical engineering plays playing crucial role and chemical process industries are playing crucial role i just wanted to highlight that through various uh, various angles i'm just trying to emphasize that point to the various angles so with this i wanted to uh, conclude what are the objectives of this course <laughs> right we wanted to explain how our petroleum refined industries are working what are the products are being produced how are they being produced what are the different types of fuel and industry gases are being produced what are the different types of polymers are being produced how they are being produced what are the different types of biomass processing industries like pulp and paper or various chemicals from the biomass that are being produced what are the various uh, what are the methods used what are the industrial methods used to produce inorganic chemicals and organic chemicals that are being used is of just talking about the methods we wanted to talk about what are the special features of design and operation various industries we wanted to explain right so since we have we are talking about multiple types of industries we want to take two or three example from each and every industry like organic chemicals we talk about two to three examples in organic chemicals we will talk about two to three examples biomass processing we will talk about two to three examples that way we will take one group of industries from that we will take two or three examples and we will tell we will show you how how this these chemicals are being produced and how a typical industry looks like those things we will explain so at the end of this course you will get to know what are the how various products are being produced in various types of chemical process industries and how to construct a process flow diagram how to construct a process flow diagram either for the existing or for a new chemical industry we will able to give you an idea insight to this one and the important thing is that through this course you will be able to know why are we studying various my like mass transfer heat transfer reaction engineering why are we studying all these courses how they are interrelated you will get to know through this course okay student do you have any doubts at this point are you able to hear me yes yeah any students have any doubts anything any questions based on whatever i discussed so far okay probably no doubts so i'll be teaching uh in the first 8 weeks 
organic chemicals, inorganic chemicals, and biomass processing industries. I will be teaching organic chemical process industries, inorganic chemical process industries, and biomass processing industries. As I said, I will not be able to cover all types of organic chemical industries, but I will take major two to three examples. Then we'll explain very detailed manner how these these things are evolved, how these industries are being produced, what are all happening in these industries. We'll explain in a we'll take one or two examples, but more detail, more way so that you'll we'll. we'll give a way so that you can understand other industries also very easily. So, as part of this, uh, um, I'll be referring these two books, Chemical Process Technology by Mauzin and Dryden's Outlines of Chemical Technology by Gopal Rao. <coughs> so the first book, I think available online, all of you can download it. If you are not able to download it, maybe you can let me know uh, next week. Then I can share book with you. The second book, Dryden's Outlines of Chemical Technology. I, I think uh, it's not available online. So, but I'm referring very less that one. So whatever portions, if I refer from this book, I will share it with you. Okay. Then these are the class schedule in the next eight weeks. So I'll be teaching up to 23rd February. Uh, my my portion I'll be teaching up to 23rd February. So I will conduct two tests, and I will also be giving one assignment. Right. So two tests and one assignment total counts 50 marks. Okay. Initially, I thought of conducting small class tests every week, but considering the current situations, uh, either due to personal or network issues, probably it may not be a good idea. I thought it may not be a good idea to conduct small class tests at regular interval. So what do you all suggest? You wanted two class tests or you wanted a small class test at regular intervals? So two class tests. Okay. So I, uh, anyway, we have the window for class tests in academic calendar. So we'll conduct class tests at that time. I don't remember whether the uh, window for class test is only third or not. Regardless, I will conduct one class test at the end of my portion so that uh, you don't have to refer again in the last time, in the last week of the semester. Luckily, we got more number of lecture hours in this semester. So it will be a little easy to cover uh, in a, all the things in a detailed manner. Uh, right. So if you wanted to just take uh, four minutes or four to five minutes break. I know it is the uh, early morning. Constantly listening to one hour theory class. So we'll take five minutes break. You all can take water or whatever. And we'll I'll start the uh, continue after five minutes. OK. So please take five minutes break. Come back uh, around maybe. 9.13. It's nine eight now, and I'll continue. Please take five minutes break and they'll continue from here.
Ja. Op. Om alle vier deur. Any questions, students? You got any concerns, questions? So, able to hear me? Can any one of you say yes if you can hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. So, CPI is a chemical process industry. Just to give a brief history, a very brief history of chemical process industry. I have a few slides on industry. The first one, uh, the first chemical produced in a large scale, moderately large scale, I mean, it's not very high, but moderately large scale, is sulfuric acid and sodium carbonate. These are the two chemicals that are produced industrially. Chemicals, chemistry being evolved much ago, but what you say is, Instead of from the laboratory scale to the large scale, I mean to say moderately, I mean not the large scale report, not the current large scale, but not in the laboratory scale. The chemicals which are converted from laboratory scale to the industrial scale, these are the chemicals which are produced. <clears throat> in uh, 1746, in earlier, uh, early 1746, sulfuric acid are produced, but they use the glass vessels, glass vessels in a very, very small quantity. First time, Roebuck has made lead lined chambers because sulfuric acid is extremely corrosive, so they had to use uh, only, uh, only glass vessels. And because of the corrosive and uh, exothermic conditions, uh, exothermic nature of the reaction, also, mist formation tendency in the sulfuric acid production, they could not produce large scale. But first, to avoid this corrosion effects in the uh, vessels, lead lined chambers, lead coated chambers were used in 1746, and you could produce sulfuric acid in a large, large manner, in large quantities. Because sulfuric acid are used in a lot of industries, leather tanning industries. Uh, many many industries you can see here uh, probably you can see the image you can see the image here so <coughs> the oxidation of sulfur into sulfur dioxide then the sulfur dioxide reacts with water to produce sulfuric acid this oxidation the oxidation of uh, uh, the oxidation of sulfur is released a lot of uh, lot of heat and also causes a lot of corrosion effects. So this one, you can see here, the center portion is lead lined chamber, where, where uh, uh, the lead is basically acting as a corrosion coating to produce uh, this one. Probably aware of in, in, in any chemistry course, you might be aware of it. After uh, this is, apart from that sulfuric acid, uh, using the lead line chamber to produce sodium carbonate because sodium carbonate became popular those days in the early inventions in the glass industries, soap industries, and textile industries. The need for sodium carbonate increased, so they wanted to produce in large quantity. Although the chemistry to produce sodium carbonate were there, but not from the natural or uh, not from the resources that can be produced in large quantity. So in 1775, French Academy of Science conducted a contest that if anybody can develop a practical method for converting uh, salt into sodium carbonate, they'll be awarded a prize money. So the famous uh, Leblanc process started from there, Nicolas Leblanc. It's in, in a profession wise, he's a surgeon, but he's more interested in practical chemistry. And uh, he invented this. Uh, he invented this process. Basically, that's why often the modern chemistry started from this Leblanc process. 
Nicolas Leblanc is often called as a founder of the modern chemistry. So he started his course. However, uh, he could not set up any factory or industry because of the French Revolution. French Revolution. But finally, that process was uh, put in industrial operation in 1823. 1823. After announcing the contest, he, he took almost four years to invent the process. But after that, because of the French Revolution, uh, it's not done. But in 1805, they made. But now, Leblanc process, even now, a lot of industries used and a lot of industries still exist based on the process. That, after that, 1850, the first oil refinery is very, very small, like one barrel, just only one barrel process. Uh, Pittsburgh in US, United States by Samuel Kyer, he started this. After that, that has grown up. After the oil era, this after from the petrochemicals, this rapid increase, rapid increase uh, took place in the development of um, chemical production. Over a period of time, uh, with the evolution of chemical cross industries because of the environmental crisis, in the 21st century, in the first decade of 21st century, the concept of sustainability became the most major important. Nowadays, it's not that you develop a method, whether it's sustainable or not, that is the major important thing. So, producing sustainable manners and producing from the sustainable resources. It's important thing. So with the fossil fuel reserves dwindling, more focus gone into renewable feedstock like biomass, uh, producing various products from the biomass, also focused on recycling of materials and the products. If we say what is the current focus, the current research growth in chemical cross industries, in terms of research, new inventions, if we see more new inventions come from the conversion of renewable feedstock to the chemicals rather than the conversion of petroleum products to the chemicals. This is the current research focus. Also, major focus going into the recycling, recycling, uh, recycling of materials and the products. That is the current research in terms of uh, chemical processes. So, with this, just to give Chemical process industries contains two major processes. One is unit operations, and the other one is unit processes. Can anyone tell me what is the difference between unit operation and unit process from any student? Please, please uh, tell, because when you interact, then only it makes it a little bit easier. For you to listen. Can anyone tell me the difference between unit process and unit operation? I, uh, Whatever. Yeah, process, please. Yeah. Unit process can, can be where like oh, only chemical changes take place, but operation involves like uh, only physical. Physical and chemical need not be a, uh, I mean, only physical changes. Right. Yeah, it's almost correct. In a better way of defining, unit process is conversion of one product to another product. Unit operation, there is no conversion, only phase change. Uh, there is no conversion of product. Whatever, uh, whatever component present in the input, the same component will present as it in the output also, but in a different form. That is unit operation. Unit process, whatever components there in the feed will not may not be there because the components are converted to new components in the reactor in the process. So that's why unit process often called reactors. Unit operations often refers to the mechanical or physical or mass transfer operations. Thank you. So why do we need to do this? Raw materials and products from the reactions are always mixture of components. We don't have as such 
whatever uh, products directly we don't have available in the natural resources. So natural resources are converted to the required component. During process, raw materials and products has to be purified. So uh, I wanted to, before I move on to the industrial processes, I wanted to review uh, our various unit operations and unit processes. Before I move on to the industrial processes, I wanted to quickly review various unit operations and various unit processes. Okay. So <clears throat> we have pure components or pure substances are divided into classified into three solid, liquid, and gas, right? Pure components and substances are divided into three solid, liquid, and gas. But in reality, we'll always have mixes. In reality, we'll always have mixes. Either solid, solid mixes, solid, liquid mixes, or solid gas mixes. Or it could be liquid, liquid. These are the best possible combinations, right? Liquid, liquid, liquid gas, or gas, gas mixes, solid gas mixes. I will give examples. Uh, what is the example for solid solid? What is the example for solid liquid? I will give all the examples one by one. And suppose you have a solid solid mixes. How to separate them into individual components? That is, we have to use one specific unit operation to separate them into individual components. So we have different possible mixes combinations. How to separate them into individual components? And that is where comes the unit operation. Regardless of solid, liquid, gas, a component, if you want to convert from one component to other component, that comes from the unit process. Right? So exactly as a student defined, physical change and a chemical change. So let me start with, ideally I can, I can start with solid, solid, but I want to start with something a little easier. Probably you're just uh, studying or you just studied recently or you're studying now. I don't know, change in curriculum is slightly confusing, but I, I think you're studying mass transfer this semester, right? Uh, we'll have mass transfer two this semester. We had mass transfer one already. Oh, so you already mass transfer done. So that means you already know some of these uh, unit operations. So that is good. Thank you. So I'll start with liquid liquid mixes. Right. Suppose we have a liquid liquid mixes. One example liquid liquid mixes are divided into two immiscible and miscible. If two components are uh, mixing each other, then it is miscible. If not mixed, then it is immiscible. Example oil water. Example, oil water. Like when you drill, uh, when you drill crude oil from the uh, reserves, we need to, uh, it will not be 100% oil. Even in the reserves, it will be, it will, it will also contain some amount of water. And that water and oil comes out. Now we need to separate that oil and water. And oil and water mixer, is comes under classification of immiscible because of the um, <clears throat> because they won't be mixed each other because of the surface tension effects. Miscible example is ethanol and water. Now we all we all using uh, maybe some percent purity ethanol or sixty percent purity ethanol for different for different applications. We need to have a different. Uh, uh, concentration. So we wanted to, if you wanted to separate or pure, if you want to produce 99% um, uh, pure ethanol from this ethanol water mixer, what methods, what unit operations we can use? So like that, we, I'll, I will try to explain. So the example for miscible is ethanol water mixer, and the example for immiscible liquid liquid mixes is oil and water. Now, first let us see how to separate immiscible liquids. Immiscible liquid separation is like slightly simpler. 
because if the density difference is very high or high, if the density difference is high, we can use gravity settling chambers. Gravity settling chambers, called, often called decanters. Often called decanters. If density difference is low, we can use centrifugal separators, that is called centrifuge, to separate this immiscible liquid liquid mixture. Right? If you have a liquid liquid mixture, if they are immiscible, if this difference is high, we need to use decanter. Like, suppose in industry where they have a liquid liquid mixture and it is immiscible, obviously we can suggest them that, yeah, you can use decanter to do this. If this difference is low, we need to suggest centrifuge or we can suggest some other methods, but one of the uh, simple and uh, commonly used method is centrifuge, centrifugal separators. Now, sometimes when we have this immiscible liquids, sometimes when we have this immiscible liquids, those immiscible liquids often tend to form the emulsions. Right? So, like in the crude oil, the example which I gave, when the crude oil comes from the uh, reserves, it contains water and oil, but usually it will come in the form of emulsion. How it becomes emulsion? How, how it actually become the emulsion? What is emulsion? Fine dispersion of minute droplets of one liquid in another liquid. Fine droplets of one liquid in another immiscible liquid. In another immiscible liquid, right? Fine droplets of one liquid in another immiscible liquid that is called emulsion. If it is miscible anyway, you will not have fine droplets. It will be a complete solution. It will be a complete solution. If it is immiscible, if, it's, if it is in the fine droplets, then that is called emulsion. So, I don't know whether I can write. Sorry, I don't have annotations. So, I, I, I'm sure all of you know emulsion, what is an emulsion. So, emulsion can be, uh, if you want to make an emulsion, if you want to make an emulsion, we can make emulsion two ways. One is surfactant stabilized emulsion, another one is particle stabilized emulsion. Surfactant stabilized emulsion, another one is particle stabilized emulsion. Students, do you know about emulsion or should I explain? If I can explain if, if you're not aware. Do you aware of emulsions? Or I can give a quick explanation to make you understand. Please don't be silent. At least you can say your opinion. So you could explain. Yeah. What happened? You're not feeling interested at all? <laughs> no responses. Only one response. I'll just take one blank slide. So let's take a container okay let's take a container uh if the container contains two things one is oil another one is water this could be a vegetable oil or sunflower oil whatever we are seeing in our home this could be any oil 
and this is water. If I take a stirrer and mix it, just take a stirrer and mix it. Can anyone tell me what will happen? Let's say I take a stirrer and mix it very high speed. Can anyone just tell me what will happen? Like how it looks like? Will it be like oil and water layers or something else? Will it be looks as before stirring or something different? Oil droplets and water. Yeah, thank you. Very good. So you will see oil droplets are formed in water. So this is water. This is water. And these are the oil droplets. Whatever droplets which I shown here, this is the oil. And remaining uh, wavy one is water. So here, water is a continuous phase. Water is a continuously present, whereas oil is present in a discontinuous manner. That is one oil, one oil droplet and the droplets are not connected. Now, if you mix it very high speed for a certain amount of time, you will see. This is called emulsion. This is called emulsion. But now, if you leave it for some time, if you leave it for some time, what will happen? Any idea? If you leave it for some time, let's say two hours, three hours, what will happen? Any idea? This, this oil droplets, this oil droplet tend to coalesce each other these oil droplets tend to collide each other and forms a bigger droplet. And with some point, after some time, after some time, you will have a, a small layer like this. Here you will have, oh, actually water uh, bottom and oil at the top. I made a mistake. So you will have an oil layer in the top and we have the water layer in the bottom. Very small creamy layer at the interface. Very small creamy layer. What is the creamy layer? Very, very fine oil droplets which are not, which are not collision each other, they will present. So you have oil and water, you mix for a long time, then you will see the oil droplets are dispersed in water. And that is called emulsion. One fine droplets of one liquid present in the other liquid. Other liquid is immiscible to first one. If it is miscible anyway, it will become solution. You will not see any droplets. If you leave the emulsion for a certain period of time, oil will separate, water will separate because of the collision between each droplets. Attractive forces with attractive forces, two droplets collide each other and forms bigger droplet and bigger droplets, bigger droplets finally becomes two layers. Even after forming two layers, you will have a very, very small creamy layer and uh, creamy layer where you will see that still the fine droplets of water or uh, oil will be present in the water. So this emulsion is not a stable emulsion. This emulsion is not a stable emulsion. Because after the emulsion, uh, once after forming emulsion, that will become separate into individual components. Right? So if you have an if you have an oil water something like this, we can separate them by gravity settling. But now sometimes we wanted a stable emulsion. Sometimes we wanted a stable emulsion. Why these, why these emulsions are unstable? Why the emulsion are unstable? We have the oil, oil, and because of the attract attraction forces, they tend to combine each other and forms the bigger droplets, bigger droplets, bigger droplets. But somehow if you can suppress this uh, collision, if somehow if you can suppress the attract attraction forces, 
then you will have a you will not have a um, uh, coalescence of the droplets and you will not have the bigger droplet formation then you will not have the uh, separation of oil and water then only you can make the stable emulsions stable emulsions are used in the cosmetic and food industries stable emulsions are used in the cosmetic and the food industries so so if you want to make a stable emulsion if you want to make a stable emulsion what they do you take water and you take oil with water they will add a component called surfactant either in water or in oil they will add a component called surfactant this surfactant has the surfactant has hydrophobic head and hydrophilic tail surfactant has hydrophobic head and hydrophilic tail so so once you put a oil in the water alone if a water plus surfactant then if you mix it then if you mix it right whenever you mix it since you are forcing since you are forcing one one liquid to move in another liquid that definitely has to form a droplet because of the interfacial tension effects since when you mix it we are forcing oil to mix in water but oil will not mix with water because of the interfacial tension effects and definitely has to take in a droplet form definitely it has to take in a droplet form now now what will happen oil is hydrophobic oil is oil is hydrophobic hydrophobic so the oil is hydrophobic this is oil this is oil and this is oil oil and this is water water is hydrophilic oil is hydrophobic water is hydrophilic oil is hydrophobic this surfactant this surfactant molecule sorry this surfactant molecule the hydrophobic end present in the oil and hydrophilic end present in the water the because this is hydrophilic right this is like to stay in water water loving hydrophilic means water loving hydrophobic means oil loving so this surfactant has a specific structure it has hydrophobic head and hydrophilic tail this hydrophilic material loves water loves to stay in the water and the hydrophobic material loves to stay in oil so these surfactant molecule tend to present at the interface tend to present at the interface right so because of this surfactant and uh, in this surfactant the attraction forces between the hydrophobic oil droplet to hydrophobic oil droplet reduced because of the presence of this hydrophilic tail at the interface the attraction forces attraction forces between two oil droplet minimizes so there is very very less chance of coagulation sorry collision between oil droplets so they will not collide each other so that will become a stable for a long time that's why it is called as stable emulsion then it is called stable emulsion stable emulsion so this is one way of forming the stable emulsion this is one way of forming the stable emulsions now you might say you might say in a crude oil how it is forming emulsion actually in crude oil to form emulsion in crude oil we won't uh, may not the presence of surfactant is less but the presence of salt ions calcium ions these ions make the uh, come and sit at the interface these sodium chloride ions and calcium carbonate these calcium ions come and sit at the interface and forms the stable emulsion there is another type of another way to produce stable emulsion
and the way to make a stable emulsion that is called particle stable particle stabilized emulsion is also called as pickering emulsions particle stable particle stable emulsions or pickering emulsions some of the particles some of the particles like uh, what is the silica some of the particles like silica silica or cellulose cellulose these particles called amphiphilic particles these particles are called amphiphilic particles that means uh, the silica or cellulose they if you put in water it will absorb water if you put in oil they will absorb oil this called amphiphilic nature that means they are loves water they loves oil hydrophobic and hydrophilic both materials so if you put let's say if you take same way oil and water plus these particles if you take oil one layer and if you take water and particles one layer and if you mix if you disperse what will happen uh, you will have again water and you have oil droplet but these particles stay at the interface these particles stay at the interface because the particles love water and the particles love oil so they come and sit at the interface some portion of the particles some like in why it is water loving why it is oil loving because in the surface functional groups some if, it, if you see the crystal structure of silica or if you see the crystal structure of cellulose it has uh, uh, the structure where the it has where we have the um, if you see the crystal structure either bcc or fcc crystal structure uh, structure some corners likes oil some corners likes the water some in the crystal structure some functional groups which is causing the hydrophobic hydrophilic loving some structures which cause the hydrophilic whatever whatever uh, uh, regions which are water loving regions they stay in the water zone whatever uh, in the crystal structure whatever areas which loving the hydrophobic uh, response with, with hydrophobic interactions they sit in the oil zone so that way these particles come at the set and makes the uh, emulsion to be stable so that's about the uh, emulsions hope you got an idea emulsions what are the different types of emulsion
sorry it got disconnect again i am also not aware when when it got disconnected which i can continue in the next class any idea when it got disconnected structure of cellulose and silica oh okay right this is all the 955 so we'll continue in the next class <coughs> and uh, you got any questions students anyone no questions thank you all thank you for your kind attention and uh, you may join your next class thank you sir thank you yeah we'll continue in next monday thank you sir yeah thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir yeah thank you have a great day to all of you and please take precautions okay